uh, delighted to speak to you uh, on this topic. They was thinking um, our panel this afternoon is centered around culture as a medium between humans and creation. And what we need today is a cultural revolution. And I was thinking, being in Frankfurt, maybe a new Frankfurt School of Theology, of eco-theology, can be born. Like, you know? So I hope my very humble reflections can help in this regard. Incarnation, implications for an eco-theology. Uh, our starting point is John 3, uh, John 1.14. You know? Kaio logos sax egeneto, no? and the word became flesh. Because as we know, doing theology is always in a context. It's incarnated in the sax of the time and the places. And uh, thanks to for the extraordinary presentation, Sister Birgit. And I hope to build on what you said, you know, where gospel really became, you know, within that flesh alive. And today. I think, and all of us think, that's the reason for our Congress today, that we need to re really radically rethink our theology, an eco-theologos. So I will offer simply seven very short reflections how we can create an eco-theologos. You know? All the Two, two, three. Two on oikos, two on theos, and finally three on logos. The first, what is the logos we are talking about? And uh, this afternoon you have been hearing a lot about Laudato Si, which has the subtitle on care for our common home. Now that's a very, very, very huge paradigm shift. It's not environmentalism. We are speaking about Earth as our common home in which the entire humanity, but the entire biotic community lives together. And the Fratelli Tutti had to follow Laudato Si. If you are in a common home, we are sisters and brothers. So this is the first reflection I would like to make. How can we rediscover Earth really as our common home? You know, I teach cosmology, and uh, it always moves me every year when, you know, when Christmas comes, that the creator of the entire universe chose our little planet. Some of you would have guessed this is the, the latest telescope we have put into space, the James Webb Telescope. I should confess, you know, I don't go to bed at least not having looked into this website. You can, James you know, Webb Telescope Tracker is free. And uh, every time when you log in, there's at least a dozen people watching with you, Some, at least a dozen. Because you are really looking into an infinite universe, which, as we know, has a diameter of 93 billion light years from one end to the other, contains something like 2 trillion galaxies, like our galaxy, the Milky Way, which contains, in turn, at least 200, 250 billion stars, like our sun. So you know, we are in this. And I think theology, we have not caught up with astronomy, with astrophysics. You know, I think we are decades behind. So how to rethink theology in that context? There again, what strikes us that it's true, Earth is a tiny little planet, but God chose, as John 1.14 says, to pitch God's tent here. Uh, you know, as a cosmologist, uh, even people like John Falking Horn at Cambridge, they are beginning to reflect why God chose this tiny little planet, I mean, which is not even as big as a grain of sand in the entire universe. Uh, there I go back to I will, the next slide, John 3.16, God so loved the world. And the more we study the planet, our Earth, we remain in awe because there are millions of factors. I've just put there, this is what scientists tell us, that we are in our solar system, what they call the habitable zone. Uh, if you're a little closer, like uh, Venus, uh, Venus, I'm sure some of you would know, has an average temperature of 460 degrees centigrade. So, you know, it, it's impossible to live. On the other hand, we have Mars that's minus 120 degrees. And, mil you know, the fact that we are tilted between 21 to 24 degrees, we have a magnetic field which allows us to have an atmosphere, 
you know, the hundreds, thousands, even millions of these factors. And I think because, you know, what I anticipated, that this planet who was prepared for life to be incarnated, I came so that you may have life and life in fullness. And in the fullness of time, uh, incarnation does take place here. But cosmologically, what, uh, you know, marvels us is that Earth is what we call this was from the Irish Bishop's Conference document, the garden planet of the universe, uh, where life had a magnificent evolution. You know, Earth is 4.52 billion years old. Life began 3.89 billion years old. Uh, and uh, life evolved uh, up to us. And the entire universe instead is like 13.82 billion years of history. But in all this, if there is a place we can really call home, uh, what the, the Pontifical Academy of Science has called a planet blessed with the gift of life. This is our planet. This is our home. So this is the, the eco-theology of the oikos, that we rediscover Earth, and also with a sense of contemplation. You know, very often we forget to do that. And this is doing, Sister Birgit, terrestrial theology, you know, that we, we return to the Earth. And uh, this is a very, very funny slide. Uh, you know, uh, Laudato Si, you know, Pope Francis was inspired by St. Francis, obviously. And we know St. Francis' conversion goes back to, you know, 1205, when he went into St. Damiano Chapel and heard the crucified Lord speaking to him, Francis, go and repair my house, you know. And he thought it was that chapel, but St. Bonaventure, later writing the life of Francis would say the, the house that the Lord meant was the entire church. And thanks to the Franciscan movement, church was reno renewed. And we think, you know, eight centuries later, another Francis comes onto the scene. No one expected him, as we know. Uh, but then he also, God gave him a mission. And Francis, go and repair our home. And this time it's not just the, cruci the crucified Lord but also the indigenous chief. I don't know if you remember, we did a, a seminar just before the Amazon Synod. And I, just like this, this afternoon I followed you. It was on ecological education. So we had together also before. And it's also the, the, the indigenous chief, the little birds, the, the polar bear, everyone telling Francis, give us a helping hand. And, and this home is crumbling. You know, we also mentioned Laudate Deu. Uh, it pains me to read Laudate Deum because, uh, you know, you see, you see Pope Francis' agony. He is really concerned. I mean, uh, sometimes it's a bit hopeless, you know, uh, because he says, 80 years have passed. Then he says, my, yet with the passage of time, I have realized that our responses have not been adequate. While the world in which we live is collapsing and maybe nearing the breaking point. So, uh, so this is the oikos, uh, about which has to, which, with which you have to begin our eco-theology. But an oikos, it was mentioned so I can go faster, which is crying out, uh, both as planet, but also as inhabitants. Uh, this is one of the best studies I have found. Uh, in a very pedagogical way, it shows the state of our planet. I'm sure most of you are familiar with called planetary boundaries. In the center, they put green color. And the first edition came out in 2009. They keep on updating. In the first edition, they said three of the boundaries were crossed. We are in red. And this is very recent. Uh, we have reached six out of nine uh, you know, sect sectors. So if someone says, you know, if we are not concerned about my home is crumbling pillar after pillar, and we are not worried. I think it, it, it's paradoxical. It's, it's schizophrenic, probably. Like, you know. And just uh, coming to the climate crisis, you know, at the Vatican, we had a very high-level interfaith meeting with scientists just before the Glasgow summit. And I remember at the end, the Joachim von Braun, you'll be proud, a German who is the president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, spoke. Uh, Professor Samani also spoke that, that day. And uh, Professor Von Brown said, yeah, I listened to all of you religious leaders for Francis' book, right at the beginning. And then he said, I think of my grandchild, Emma. And uh, by the time she will have my age, 
maybe around 60 years old. Some parts of the world will be unlivable, literally. And uh, this is what uh, a scientific study says. IPCC has picked it up. That right now, 0.8%, this is 1% of the planet's surface is unlivable. You know, think of uh, Sahara, Saudi Arabia, because so hot, it may just not go out. And the, the study is saying by 2070, 19% of the planet will be unlivable. And uh, that means the, 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 the tropical belt where nearly a billion people live, and mostly you know, the, the poor people. So uh, the, this oikos is in danger, and uh, climate crisis says next 12 years are crucial. And uh, this was also mentioned, what we call the tipping points. This, you know, from a scientific point of view, I think this creates agony with any. Uh, because there are so many of these tipping points, the Greenland, and uh, you know, the summer, the West Antarctic ice sheet, and the Amazon, uh, the, the coral reefs, and, and all these are connected. And everything is connected. That's the title of our Congress. This summer, I was you know, amused. I knew something. But the one scientific study showed that how the Amazon rainforest conditions, how much of snow will fall on the Himalayas in, the, in Tibet. Imagine, thousands of kilometers away. And, will, and conditions the West Antarctic ice sheet is stability. So all these are, are connected. Uh, so this oikos is in, is in danger, but it's also just not the planet. It's the cry of the poor. You know, both everyday experience and scientific research show that the gravest effects of all attacks on the environment are suffered by the poorest. That's why Laudato Si, as we know, is a social encyclical. Uh, the word climate is mentioned 14 times, the word poor 59 times. Not, you know, uh, just figuratively, because the climate crisis, the ecological crisis affects food security. Again, going to the, to the Andes in South America. It affects human health. Now, these are fundamental human rights for food nutrition, for health, and for shelter. And uh, the second slide is from Bangladesh. And I remember one missionary told us in the dicastery that uh, they went, the Amazon, they went, the, the, the monsoon, monsoon rains come, and often they are floods, and water remains for months and months. And uh, imagine people living in those homes. Like you know. Also because we know that today, uh, dirty water kills more children than all the other diseases put together. Uh, so it affects human health in many parts of the world and, and migration, which you know everywhere has become a political issue, especially for populist uh, parties. Uh, we did a study at the Dicastri in 2021 on climate crisis and displacement with experts around the world. And what we discovered was that today, Ecological factors, climate crisis in particular, cause three to 10 times more displacement than all the other factors. So I mentioned the 19% of you know, Earth being uninhabitable. So when, uh, when there are droughts and floods, people have to relocate. Uh, and of course, just mentioned uh, what world are we living in you know, one of the most uh, powerful paragraphs of Laudato Si. No? What kind of world do we want to leave to those who, are, who, those who come after us, to children who are now growing up? So these are the first two reflections. In an eco-theology, can we recover really Earth as our common home? Beginning with a sense of contemplation or oh, wonder, then feel the agony of this planet and of its inhabitants, both human and non-human. Let's go to the second component Theos, how can we rethink Theos? And Laudato Si in the second, para in the second chapter offers us a direction. When it's for the first time, I mean, it's again a paradigm shift in theology, when uh, Pope Francis tells us that creation is already gospel, is evangelio, it is good news. Uh, that's the very, very title, the second chapter, what we call the gospel of creation. And uh, which is very ancient, you know, because we know the fathers of the church used to speak about the two books of God, the book of works and the book of words. And the book of works came much earlier. It's God's first 
and primordial revel revelation. And St. Augustine said beautifully, this like, these are like the two shoes of God. And we need both the shoes or the two eyes. And uh, to have a you know, full vision, we need to look at creation through both the books. And, and uh, Pope Francis reminds us that God has written a precious book whose letters are the multitude of created things present in the universe. Creation is indeed the very first epiphany of God. And uh, here, uh, St. Francis, faithful to scripture, invites us to see nature as a magnificent book in which God speaks to us and grants us a glimpse of his infinite beauty and goodness. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, the theological vision of creation. Uh, but I think even going deeper, and I really wish we, we really reflected on, you know, how, that on the fact that God became cosmic dust, that God became flesh uh, on this planet. Um, uh, today, we, more than ever, we need to return to the image of an incarnate God who enters human and cosmic vicissitudes. At the heart of our Christian faith is the very incarnation of God. With the incarnation, earth becomes God's very home, you know, which is a very profound theological insight. It's not just our home, it's God's home. That, you know, sometimes when people say, Let's, we need to go to the Holy Land, and I think, when you look, think of the entire universe, this one place you can literally call the holy. The entire universe is permeated by the spirit. Uh, but where God put his, you know, God's footprints are there. It is this planet. As St. John writes in the prologue, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Last few years I've been reflecting, you know, uh, the Genesis happens in a garden. <coughs> but the resurrection, the next, you know, <laughs> big event of God, incarnation, the resurrection also happens in a garden, uh, which is interesting. And if you were to close the Bible, Revelation 21 speaks about, it's about a garden, a garden city. Today we mentioned, mentioned city. It's a garden city, new heaven, new earth. So uh, let's recover the profound implications of incarnation. Time is passing, so I will... Uh, Go to the last section of, of Theos, uh, Oikos, Theos, Logos. So what type of Logos? What discourse can we make? And I would say many implications, at least three, it was already mentioned, to embrace an integral ecological vision. I think what we need is, what we are lacking is, is a metaphysics of relationality. And I don't think we will, we will solve the ecologic crisis unless we, we propose a new metaphysics. You know, and Laudato Si has this beautiful paragraph, 66, that human life, and I would say every life, everything, is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships, that we exist only in relationships that our Aristotelian or classical metaphysics has been one of identity, I as an individual. Yeah, but individuals exist as a, as a relationship. I exist in a family, in a society, in a, in a university, whatever. So with God, with the Creator, for believers, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. And uh, it, the, because this is the nature of all reality. And it's beautiful, and I always admired your, one of your most important theologians in Germany, Jürgen Moltmann. Decades ago, anticipated this. You know this uh, that our and I, as a Christian, as a Catholic, I'm originally from India, but too many years in the Hindu. Uh, but you know, when we speak of other religions, and and, and I, I think our uniqueness is maybe the only religion that speaks of God as community. And probably we are not aware of this treasure we have that God is communion. No? Uh, the Trinitarian God has left its mark on all creatures and saying, for Francis goes back to St. Bonaventure. No? And St. Uh, Francis, is, Saint Francis is, is the example of integral ecology. In fact, Laudato Si chapter four on integral ecology, 
concludes uh, quoting St. Francis, subtitle of a section, which uh, anyway I take from paragraph 10 right from the beginning. I believe that St. Francis is the example par excellence of care for the vulnerable and of an integral ecology lived out joyfully and authentically. He shows us how just inseparable the bond is between concern for nature, the earth, justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. So peace at all, all three, I would say even four levels. Let's go to this. The first thing is we need a, a theology that is integral. And uh, this, I think, is what's lacking. We need, a, we need to recover the prophetic voice of theology. And I'm getting more and more convinced. The logos of eco-theology needs to be decisively prophetic, especially in the face of profound injustices. And Professor Zamani highlighted that, the great inequalities that in which we live. The divide human communities living within a common home is a contradiction. We live in a common home, but it's not a one home. And eco-theology will muster courage to denounce the socio-economic structures that contribute to the cry of the earth and the, and the poor. Leonard the Wolf was cited. And uh, what I like to call, it will place justice at the center of theologizing, in fidelity also to the magisterium of the poor. You might, it might sound strange to years coming from the Vatican. I speak of this magisterium. And I think this is uh, at the feet of the poor. You know, we need to sit. And uh, as Sister Birgit said, theologizing with the poor. Because our, our, our world is, is divided. You know, this is a very interesting study that came out of the Lancet magazine. That's uh, the, 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 the journal for doctors one of the best, you know, the Lancet uh, Journal for Medicine. Now this is the, the, what they call the climate apathy, the two worlds in which we live. On top we have the map of the world in terms of greenhouse gas emissions that cause the climate crisis. And you see the, the US is so conspicuous, Europe is also so evident, India, I think also for population, China obviously. And uh, sadly you don't see Africa on the top, you know, uh, that map of the world. Below, we have the map of the world in terms of mortality. People die, it was a medical journal, people dying due to the climate crisis. And you see Africa so, so, so conspicuously evident. You know. As it was mentioned, Africa contributes, in spite of being more, more than a billion people, contributes hardly 4% of emissions. And it's not just global north and south, we are seeing it all over. And, and, and I think Samuel is from India, though from Bangalore, <laughs> not from Mumbai. Uh, this is the city of Mumbai, where we have the richest person of Asia living there, someone by name, Ambani, uh, who has a house of 27 floors, imagine. You know, he, his wife, and three children, by now grown up, they have a house, a house of 27 floors, imagine one family. And in the same city of Mumbai, hardly a few kilometers away, you have the largest slum of Asia, Dharavi, where one million people live huddled together. So this is the inequality we are seeing all over. The same thing you can see in Sao Paulo or Jakarta or anywhere. Uh, the, the, the undivided world. And uh, the latest study which was released before the COP in Dubai that has that highlighted this. And uh, the study was showing, for example, how the richest 1% of people contribute as much as 66% of, of people in terms of emissions. 1% emitting as much as 66% of humanity. Uh, this, then the top 10% emitting 50% of emissions. The middle class, another 40 3% of emissions, and the poor half of humanity, something like 7 to 8%, which is a contradiction, and we can't ask them to make sacrifices. You know. So th this, I think, is, a, is the core of, of an eco-theology uh, that assumes responsibility, but also speaks out. Uh, to, to recover our Eucharistic vocation of human communities, namely to share the gifts of creation 
with all the members of our common household in a spirit of communion, koinonia, like the one bread broken and shared at the table of the Lord. The earth is indeed humankind's common table, laid by God for all. Around that table we gather in a spirit of conviviality, not in competitive scramble, the economy of today, but in joyful fellowship. Beautiful words, nurturing and sheltering one another. So this is the, the, the Eucharistic, Eucharist lived, and uh, I'm a citizen of Don Bosco. This, we work with, streets, with children on the street, and this is from the Philippines. I'm sure you're familiar with this. This artist died of cancer, unfortunately, but then he, he create, created a foundation and he left everything for children on the street. So they, all, they, they live much better lives now. But this is, um, can you ask one question? It's related to students. How many people go hungry every day now? Because after COVID, it's rising again. Can you just throw a number? Millions, obviously. How many people go to bed hungry? Just say one number. Don't, don't be afraid. Two million. Two, no, many more. It's like 821 million. It's one out of 10. So, uh, yeah, that reminds me of another theologian. I'm concluding in two minutes and done. You know, Samuel Ryan, who years ago, in an, in, in an ecumenical meeting, he said, uh, uh, it's true that uh, uh, in sacramental theology, without bread, we cannot celebrate the Eucharist. But then he asked, without bread, and uh, without bread for all, can we really celebrate the Eucharist? You know? So this is the question. Uh, and the third the, uh, dimension of, um, of, uh, of the logos of an eco-theology, it has to be action-oriented. And our children are telling us this. Time is running out. Uh, and so there again, we need to uh, begin a synodal journey. I want to conclude on this note. Uh, in ecological conversion, we need to speak of we revolution, again, picking up from you, Sister Birgit. Uh, oil companies have been selling this idea, you can change the world. No, you don't change the world. And they have managed to keep on selling petroleum uh, all these years. Just one example. <coughs> Economy tells you are the center of the world. No. We say we are the center. Uh, so we are proposing, uh, I can give you information afterwards, uh, in 2021, Pope Francis, at the end of the Laudato Si year, launched the Laudato Si action platform. Where we're inviting, it's, we are inviting, we are reached nearly 100 million people now. Uh, like, you know, we are inviting everyone, a family, a parish, a diocese, a school or a university, even civil universities are joining, uh, or a, a, a hospital, healthcare center, a business, a farm, uh, a group, movement, organization, a religious order, like the Jesuits, the Salesians, the Franciscans, you know, they're, they're all joining. And Jesuits have joined as an entire family. That in seven years, you can become a laudato si reality, totally sustainable. So this is an element of hope that together we can change the world. I've kept you to the time almost. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.